And so in my second talk today, I want to talk about error processing. Um, we've learned a lot about um, you know, what the brain does right and what, what happens when, when uh, complicated things are being solved and how they're being solved by the brain. And now I want to talk about th things that fascinate me because I'm an oaf and I make errors all the time. What, what do we do um, you know, when, when we make an error? Um, and so why would we care about that? Or you know, why do we need a new theory of error processing at all? You know, we have a whole lot of theories already, a whole lot of really well accepted, uh, very well respected theories. Why do we need a, a new one? Um, well, you know, if you go through these theories, uh, yes, they're all very sensible and, and they, they have great aspects to them. But uh, in one aspect, they all may or half of them make opposite prediction from the other half. Um, so you can basically group these theories by whether they are adaptive theories or maladaptive theories. Um, with an adaptive theory making the prediction that post-error processes are beneficial towards subsequent behavior. You make an error, your processing kicks in, and you, whatever you do ultimately is geared at improving your next, uh, your next trial behavior. Um, and more recent maladaptive theories have been really influential in pushing back on that notion and saying, you know, actually what's happening after errors is detrimental to subsequent performance. Um, and now generally speaking, obviously you can translate that into a very, very simple empirical prediction. The adaptive theories would propose that post-error accuracy would go up and the maladaptive theories would propose that post-error accuracy goes down. And so there you have your empirical test and you can just run an experiment, see which one's the case and throw half of the theories out. Now I talk isn't over uh, because the problem isn't solved and the problem actually goes back to um, you know, the, the most foundational work on error processing by Laming and by Rabin and Rogers, with Laming finding post-error increases in accuracy and Rabin and Rogers finding post-error decreases in accuracy or a higher rate of what they call double errors. And in subsequent years, that empirical picture has not clarified and you know, studies still find results on both sides of the equation um, with uh, uh, you know, uh, really no coherent factor that, that determines whether uh, you know, of which side of the equation you're going to come up, come down on. So for example, these studies here are all flanker studies. So it's not as simple as, well, in some tasks, you'll see this and in others, in other tasks, you'll, you'll, you'll see that. Um, now, one really important aspect uh, here um, is the response stimulus interval, which uh, goes back to the seminal work by Jens and Ducic, who basically reported that when the response stimulus interval is short, post-error accuracy will be decreasing. And if the response stimulus interval is long, you will find post-error increases in accuracy. And so this uh, led them to propose their uh, maladaptive theory of, of er error processing, which is the bottleneck theory, which basically proposes that error processing is effortful and therefore uh, binds resources, takes it away from task performance on future trials, and thereby you're going to get worse on future trials. So what I want to introduce now is, is you know, kind of my, my take, my stab at, at trying to find a theory of error processing that I uh, wrote uh, in 2017 or so. Um, and the idea here is to, to incorporate the, the new thrust at the time, really, of these maladaptive theories of error processing and incorporate them into an adaptive theory, because I do believe that the brain operates in the service of adaptive behavior and that generally speaking what the brain does is optimizing things and making ideal predictions and and trying to you know reduce prediction error and and generally speaking uh you know optimize behavior in the service of of improvement and learning um and so i am a proponent of an adaptive theory but uh, you know i do want to find a place for these these maladaptive ostensible maladaptive processes in error processing so the idea here all basically goes back to the fact that an error is just a specific example of a violation of expectancy. So it's just an unexpected event. It's either you made an action plan uh, and that didn't map onto the action that you actually performed. So you suboptimally performed an action or you performed the correct action, but you didn't get the outcome that you wanted for whatever reason. And so you have a violation of expectation. And at the core of the theory is that any type of violation of expectation will trigger an automatic cascade of processing that starts with inhibition, with broad and non-selective inhibition of both motor and cognitive activity. And that's actually what, 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 the, talk, what the empirical part of today's talk is, is, is going to be about. So I'll come back to this. And the purpose of this inhibitory effort, though, is to facilitate attentional reorienting specifically towards finding what produced the violation of, ex of its expectancy. 
And so this cascade of inhibition and attentional orienting, which I talked a little bit about in the uh, morning talk, um, is really universal to all unexpected events, not just action errors. But if the attentional orienting phase identifies the source of the expectancy violation as an action error, then you have controlled processing that kicks in and that, that can be highly specific, not just to errors themselves, but to the type of error. So task set reconfiguration, perceptual retuning, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately the whole idea here is that this all leads to increased accuracy down the line. Now, how does this explain post-error decreases in accuracy, especially depending on the RSI? Well, it's because there is an, a, a, an overarching theme here, which is what happens to the focus of attention. The idea is that when you are doing a task, your attention is preoccupied with the current task set, but then when you, perform, when you make an error, this inhibitory uh, inhibition attentional orienting cascade will interrupt your ongoing task set and the associated motor programs and cognitive representations and shift your attention towards finding the, the source of the violation. And once that's identified, your attention will shift again towards designing the specific adaptive measures that will help you retool your task set in the service of improving behavior down the line. But importantly, there's a, a critical time period here during which the task set is suspended. It's, it's the task set is inhibited um, and the attention is, is, is pulled away from the task set and towards other processes, towards these adaptive ostensible processes. And that basically explains these post-error accuracy effects and how they de depend on the RSI. Because um, if a stimulus occurs with a short RSI, it'll occur or it can occur while the attentional focus is on identifying the source of the violation still. And so then if you have to um, you know, prematurely reorient back to the task set in order to respond to the stimulus, your accuracy will go down. And so that'll happen at a short task set. At an intermediate duration task set, you can have a situation in which you know, maybe you have identified the source of the violation your adaptive measures, though, aren't fully designed yet. The task set is still not retooled. It's unchanged, but you can more easily reorient to it um, because you've already proceeded further into this cascade. So in that case, maybe post-error accuracy will be unchanged. Uh, unchanged. But uh, importantly, in uh, with a, for a long RSI, you will see increases in post-error accuracy because then you've actually implemented your full set of adaptive responses. You've retooled your task set and you've re-engaged with it. And so I should say there's a whole, you know, neuroscientific underbody to this theory. Um, you know, we have a lot of evidence for, for all of the aspects here uh, in this theory, and I'm not going to go too much into detail in today's talk, that any type of expectancy violation, including action errors, will engage these neural networks. So the inhibition network that I talked about in detail this morning that, you know, consists of pre-SMA, right IFC, and STN will become activated. The Corbetta and Schulman circuit breaker orienting network, the locus ceruleus norepinephrine system, all these things are known to be active after errors. And we also know from, you know, Marcus Olsberger's work and Tobias Egner's work that there are very specific ad adaptive processes that the brain does implement in the service of increasing accuracy if the RSI is long enough, uh, I would argue. And so what I want to focus now on, like I said, is this inhibitory uh, proposition here. And I want to give you a brief background as to, you know, how uh, and why I think this inhibitor, you know, errors lead to global and non-selective inhibition of motor and cognitive processes. So it all goes back to this study, which is kind of the last study that I did in graduate school, where uh, we basically just ran a conjunction fMRI analysis between action errors and correctly performed actions that didn't pr uh, produce the expected outcome. So in both cases, you're getting a suboptimal outcome, not the outcome that you wanted, but in one case, you, it's because you made an error. In the other case, it's just because your environment uh, behaves in an unexpected way. And so what we find is that, you know, this, this, this common network is activated following both types of event. And this network um, includes the pre-SMA, the right inferior frontal cortex, and the subthalamic nucleus, which is this inhibition network. Now, that's obviously inverse inference, and we have some, some additional uh, evidence to suggest that there is actual inhibition going on after these unexpected uh, events. But you can also just look at behavior and, and find some further evidence for this proposition, because it's pretty well known that errors produce what's called post-error slowing, where reaction times are slowed following error commission. And the same thing is true for unexpected action outcomes of otherwise correctly performed actions. So there is something that could be interpreted behaviorally as inhibition, at least. That doesn't mean that that's what's really going on. And again, both these things are inverse inference. 
but this isn't. So this is basically our first attempt at like trying to really nail down the fact that unexpected events, not action errors in this particular case, but just a generally a general unexpected event will produce uh, inhibition of the motor system. So this is measuring corticospinal excitability from a specific muscle. And I've talked about this this, this morning already, but basically you stimulate a sensory motor cortex. Um, you measure EMG from the target muscle that is controlled by that part of, of sensory motor cortex. And you uh, produce this deflection in the motor evoked potential, which uh, indexes corticospinal excitability. And we find that when participants are doing a simple reaction time task where they sometimes are presented with unexpected perceptual events, then their uh, corticospinal excitability is reduced, even though there's no instruction to inhibit anything. And Yao Guan in my lab, who's a postdoc, actually now has evidence to suggest that these exact same thing is going on after action errors. Because again, we think that action errors are just a specific example of an unexpected um, event or an unexpected action outcome in this sense. But in the current study that I want to present today, I'm actually not going to talk about the suppression of the motor system that is brought about you know, by this network that is ostensibly active after unexpected events and action errors. I want to talk about the, um, the interruption of cognitive processing. So this is a study in which we uh, ran a very simple working memory paradigm, kind of a Sternberg type paradigm where you see a, you get a stimulus, you have a delay interval, and then you have a second stimulus uh, string of letters. And you're supposed to make a decision of whether the second string of letters matches the first string of letters. And in the delay interval, you know that you're going to expect a certain beep tone that you have practiced with. But then on, in the actual experiment, that beep tone is replaced by an unexpected birdsong segment. Behaviorally, what we find is that these unexpected events in the delay interval reduce the accuracy on the working memory probe. So they, they, uh, they, they interrupt or they, we argue, inhibit uh, the active working memory content in the delay interval. We believe that the primary evidence for the fact that this is an inhibitory effort is because the subthalamic nucleus, which is a really very like narrowly defined region and has very specifically assigned functions um, in the basal ganglia, uh, is active after these unexpected events. And moreover, the activity of the subthalamic nucleus following the unexpected event mediates the behavioral effects that the errors, that the unexpected events have on working memory accuracy. So in other words, unexpected sounds that triggered more activity in the subthalamic nucleus led to more uh, errors on the working memory probe, and which is, we believe to be reflective of an interruption or an inhibition of the active working memory content in the delay interval. So you've noticed that for the last two trials, I haven't really, uh, sorry, last two trials, last two slides, I haven't really talked about errors at all. Um, so let's come back to errors and actually answer this question. Do errors inhibit active verbal working memory representations? Is the same thing that we found here for unexpected events, which you know makes sense in terms of a distraction perspective perhaps, true for action errors? And so this is a behavioral study uh, that we ran here. This is in collaboration with Chufang. Um, and it's basically the same task as in the Nature Communications paper from 2016, where we have this Sternberg type working memory paradigm. We have a delay interval, but the delay interval doesn't contain any unexpected events. It just contains a motor task. And in this particular case, it's a conflict task, an Erickson Flanker task, where uh, we have three different conditions of interest. One condition is um, you know, a purely congruent condition, where all six trials that you do here in the delay interval on this motor task are congruent, so the flankers point in the same direction as the target. We have an incongruent condition where you have um, half of the trials containing incongruent stimuli like this one, where the target stimulus mismatches the, the response um, cued by the flanker stimuli. And then we can compare within those incongruent stimuli trials in which participants made errors on any of the six uh, responses in the uh, delay interval, two trials in which they had incongruent, uh, incongruent stimuli but didn't make any action errors. And therefore, we can, we can investigate whether action errors lead to um, a reduction of the working memory uh, representation or whether it's just the role of conflict, for example. And this, you know, this is a very, the very first our very first try basically, well, the very first try after the pilot study and the pilot study also showed this is basically showed that indeed conflict alone doesn't make a difference in terms of working memory accuracy. So you can compare a, a six purely uh, congruent trials to a, a mixed congruency block. If you don't make any errors, it doesn't make a difference for working memory. But if you do make errors, um, you do see uh, th these differences. And moreover, in an exploratory data analysis here, we found that there is a strong correlation 
between this effect that we call ERIAM, error-related interruptions of active memory, I believe, um, and their overall working memory accuracy that these uh, subjects had. So these things aren't inherently correlated. We made sure that that's the case. But basically what this correlation reflects is that people who had already worse working memory accuracy overall were more susceptible to interruptions by action errors, which we interpret as they already have more brittle working memory representations, which are more susceptible to interruptions by these, these motor errors. So we wanted to first replicate this finding then, and we also wanted to make sure um, that we negotiate this uh, with the uh, bottleneck theory of Jens and Dutschik, because what could be going on here is that, well, you know, maybe there's just a processing bottleneck where errors are grabbing, uh, 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 intermittently grabbing processing power away from the working memory. But if you have a long enough uh, time after the error to get back to the original representation, you can easily recuperate it versus the adaptive orienting theory would argue that once it's inhibited, it's gone. And so we replicated this finding, same paradigm, except with a much longer um, response stimulus interval. So this response stimulus interval here is almost two and a half seconds, which is two and a half times longer than the long response stimulus interval in the Jens and Dutschik study, where they found uh, post-error uh, increases in accuracy. So the bottleneck is way over by that point. And when we ran this study, we found the exact same effect and moreover with a, with a vastly increased effect size. So the, the working memory uh, decrease following action errors in the delay interval is even greater in this version of the study. And the same correlation between this IRIAM effect and the uh, overall working memory accuracy is still, um, is still in place. And so then what we did is we did a series of experiments in which we tried to see whether this effect generalizes to other conflict tasks here in the delay interval. So one example here is this is no longer a, a, a regular Erickson flanker paradigm. This is now a temporal flanker paradigm, which is a paradigm that's been introduced by, by Elliot and Eric Schumacher, um, where the logic is similar, but essentially you're supposed to just respond to the second in a sequence of, of, of letters, and you're supposed to ignore the, the preceding letters, which can map onto a different response. And so you can introduce incongruency that way. And so the question is, does this now generalize? And what we found is that while the effect is numerically still there, it's no longer significant. So we don't find this effect any longer, but we still find this strong correlation between the size of this interruption effect and overall working memory accuracy. And as a matter of fact, we found this across six experiments, extremely reliable in terms of a correlation, which really brought us to believe that what's going on here is if you make the task sufficiently difficult, and if you make participants working memory representations brittle enough and susceptible to interruption, then you will find these ERM effects in everyone, even in a paradigm like this, where we haven't previously found it. So as a final step, what we did here is we basically just made the task more difficult. In all experiments, uh, I didn't mention this, we had a gauging procedure that uh, used uh, an adaptive staircasing algorithm to find an ideal load for each participant that is challenging for them, but not so challenging as to bring them to chance level. And so all we did is we made this algorithm a little bit more strict. And as a matter of fact, we just added one to their load. We made sure that they can still respond with above chance accuracy. And then we, we uh, suggested that with this more difficult load, you would find the ERM effect even in this paradigm on the group level. And that's exactly what we found. And again, we find the same correlation. So just to uh, uh, sum this up here real quick, um, you know, I think we have some evidence now for the fact that errors uh, inhibit ongoing cognitive activity. Now, there is still work to be done here. This is our first foray into this domain. We're going to do much more work. Um, there is a lot of evidence for, there's a lot of other studies that have come out in recent years, including from Fabrice Parmentier and Tobias Aigner, that have explicitly tested uh, some propositions of this adaptive orienting theory. So we do think it has some, some legs, and we'll see um, in the future what other propositions we can test of this theory. Um, I want to thank my lab again, um, and specifically the error processing experts in my lab, Yu Zhang Chu, uh, grad student, and Yao Guan, the uh, post error, uh, the, the postdoc, sorry. Um, Yu Zhang has some great data that I couldn't get to um, pertaining to post error slowing in the context of this theory. But yes, thank you very much for your attention.